Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 248 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Two stops down and two to go. We're back in the car and headed for the third stop in our four-episode road trip through Ben Franklin's world. We have a long drive ahead of us today because our next destination is 401 miles south of Schoharie Crossing State Historic Site. We're off to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Our drive begins on I-87 South. This will take us down the Hudson River Valley, into New Jersey, and onto the Garden State Parkway. And as we drive through southern New Jersey, you may wish to play episode 192. In that episode, we learn all about the legend of the Jersey Devil, which supposedly lives in southern New Jersey. Plus, episode 192 is just a lot of fun. That was the first episode where we debuted our non-phone call recording method. So I think you'll just really enjoy the story and the great audio. Now, feel free to take a detour as we drive. You may wish to stop off in Philadelphia or in Wilmington, Delaware at the Delaware Historical Society. But for now, I plan to drive straight through to Washington, D.C. Do you remember when we first visited the National Museum of African American History and Culture? We came in 2016 to speak with its founding director, Lonnie Bunch. Back then, we were on a quest as part of our very first Doing History series to learn more about how historians work. And Lonnie, he helped us conclude our quest by taking us through his museum work. Our conversation with Lonnie was so interesting that I spent an entire morning in February 2017 trying to secure tickets to see this museum in person. Do you remember how hard tickets were to see this newest Smithsonian when it first opened? We're lucky because today we shouldn't have any problems getting in. Now, I did secure those tickets and I got to see the museum in person in May 2017. And when I think back on my visit, I know part of why I enjoyed the museum so much was because we had had this opportunity to speak with Lonnie and get his insight into how he and his colleagues created the museum. So I was walking around and having these behind-the-scenes stories going on in my head all the time. And that's my hope for you, too. We'll revisit this conversation with Lonnie, and you'll have a much richer visit to the museum. Look at that. We've made it. And what's this? A nearby parking space? Perfect. Now remember, we have just one more stop to make on our road trip, which we'll do next week, and then we're going to come back all new with episode 250. But for right now, we should head inside the National Museum of African American History and Culture and meet with its founding director, Lonnie Bunch. Our guest for this behind-the-scenes look is Lonnie Bunch, the founding director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. He began his career as an urban historian specializing in the 19th century, and after teaching at universities, he fell in love with museums and has since worked at the National Air and Space Museum, the California African American History Museum, the National Museum of American History, and the Chicago Historical Society. Today, he is best known for his work as the founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Lonnie Bunch. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Lonnie. You're a historian who's always worked to reach both academic and public audiences through all aspects of your work, your teaching, your writing, and your work as a museum curator and director. Why and how have you worked to reach so many different audiences with your scholarship? Well, I think I realized early on that we historians talk a lot about the value of history how important it is, how we contextualize, how we provide insights. But often we're talking to a select group of people, our colleagues and our students. I realized that history was too important to be just in the hands of a small group. And for me, museums gave me the opportunity to have conversations with an awful lot of people, to get people who maybe wouldn't wrestle with questions of history, but they're going to do it because they're coming into a museum. Yeah. Why do you think that museums are so special? Why do you think they're able to reach all those people who wouldn't normally engage with history? I think there's a couple of reasons. I think, first of all, surveys have told us that the public trusts museums. As they're being inundated with information through the Internet, people are struggling to figure out what's true. What can I count on? Well, they know they can always trust museums. But I also think that part of what is so important about museums is that they're a social animal. 
In essence, what happens is that when museums are at their best, it's almost like a backyard picnic, that one person will say something, and even if you're only listening, you'll then jump in and say, but I think this, or my story's different. What I love about museums is I watch people who don't know each other share common stories or debate issues, or I watch grandparents talk to grandchildren about important moments in the past. So for me, museums give people the freedom to wrestle with the past in an environment that's not challenging to them in a way that they don't want to be productive. What it does is it allows them to feel comfortable as they wrestle with the past. What's your favorite part about doing history in museums? We know that history museums have exhibits and public programs, and some have technology to help visitors get the information they seek. So what's your favorite part? My favorite part, candidly, is realizing that if you're going to work in a museum, you can't tell the past without learning from the living community. So I love the fact that when we collected an artifact like freedom papers from a particular family, the family also told us about how important the document was to them or how it was passed down and what were the traditions around it. So for me, my favorite part is being able to take an object, take a story and learn so much more from the people who owned it or who were shaped by it. When we spoke with Jim Horn about different historical sources, he told us about oral histories and how they can be great and also problematic. Do you encounter any challenges using the oral histories about the documents and artifacts you collect as you create the museum exhibits people can trust? Well, I think that we know as scholars that memory is something that you can't always count on. And so part of what we always do is try to find different pieces of evidence to support the kind of oral histories that we do. But sometimes it's important to just let people's memories be out there because those memories will shape and push other people to share their stories. And the more evidence, the more truths you can find, the closer you can become to get the historical accuracy. It sounds like you can almost use the oral histories you collect to make history more personal and current rather than just something that happened ages ago. I think that historians, especially museum people, sometimes forget to humanize history. We tell the grand narrative. We talk about migration. We talk about slavery. But for the public, they need to see this reduce the human scale. They've got to say, how can I understand that millions of people were affected by the slave trade? Ah, well, maybe if we reduce it to the story of a single ship and we can then humanize it. And through that humanization, suddenly it's not something that you just walk past. Suddenly you begin to think about what does this mean if I was in that situation? How should I think differently about the individuals who experience that? So for me, the greatest challenge is to tell the grand narrative, but to reduce it to human scale. As we're talking, I get the sense that people really fascinate you. And I wonder if you would tell us about your first research project, which investigated leaders of free black communities in America prior to the Civil War. Was it the people who attracted you to this project? Part of what was so interesting to me was, first of all, discovering things I didn't know anything about, right? One day I was sort of wandering through the library in those days, you know, with card catalogs, right? And he just wandered through the library and I found a biography of a free black man who lived in Natchez. And I remember thinking, I didn't know anything about that. And so I began to sort of look at how do I find more information about people who were free before the Civil War and how did they live their lives at a time when most of their brethren and sisters were in bondage? And I began to look at newspapers especially burly black newspapers and abolitionist newspapers. And I realized there were so many stories that I could find by looking at those newspapers. So that got me excited about trying to figure out who the free black community was. And then how did they negotiate in places that didn't want them? How did they find ways to keep family, to find education? And I realized that for me, learning about the free black community really helped me understand how African-Americans have always tried to find a way out of no way to make the best of what they had and to bring innovative tactics to changing America. And that's what the free black community taught me. Did the free black leaders you studied teach you anything specific about how they interacted with their communities that you've been able to use and draw on in your various museum positions? One of the things that I learned from that early project was how 
strategic people were and how innovative they were in utilizing the resources of their day, whether it was suddenly utilizing the press to convey information. And so it really helped me throughout the rest of my career think about how do African Americans, how do many people make a way out of no way? What are the traditions? What are the techniques they bring? How are people full of the ability to improvise? And that notion of improvisation has really shaped the way I've looked at the African American community through my whole career. I'm fascinated by the innovation that people have brought, whether it was the way the civil rights movement utilized the media to get public attention. And so for me, it really was saying that change doesn't happen without real strategy, without creativity, but also without a boldness that comes from innovation. It seems like you must have had to get innovative and strategic with your present job, because earlier this year, in 2016, you wrote an article for Smithsonian Magazine and noted that when you assume the position of founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, you had quite a few tasks to accomplish. You had to articulate a vision for the museum, hire a staff, find a site to build the museum, amass a collection, design and construct a building to display said collection, raise over $500 million, ease apprehension among African American history museums by showing them how a national museum of African American history and culture would benefit all museums, learn how to work with the most powerful and influential museum and cultural board, and answer all arguments that the museum was unnecessary. This is not a short to-do list, Lonnie. Would you tell us what role history and your research played in helping you accomplish those tasks? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, any time as a historian, you are doing research, you're writing something, the first thing is to figure out how to make order out of this, how to make order out of chaos. So in a way, being able to sort of look at a big picture and to reduce it down to say, here are the steps I need to take to get from A to B. And that helped me begin to define this. And then I thought, for example, what was the most important thing to do? The most important thing to do was to create a vision. And part of that vision of saying that how do we take a museum that on the surface is about a particular community, but how do you take that community and use it as a lens to understand what it means to be an American, to say this is a broader story. It is a particular story. It is a story that a community can find great solace and inspiration from. But even more importantly, it's a story that profoundly shapes all Americans. And that really came from really looking at people like, oh, Phyllis Wheatley or Frederick Douglass or Ida B. Wells, who basically claimed their Americanness. They claimed the fairness that they expected from America. So for me, claiming the Americanness of the African-American story was really the key to crafting the vision for the museum. You just mentioned several individuals, Phyllis Wheatley, Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells. And part of being a historian is being able to look at the evidence you've collected and deciding which people and stories to include in your book, article, or museum exhibit, and which people and stories to leave out. What was that process like for you while you were crafting the vision for the museum and crafting the museum itself? Oh, that was probably one of the hardest things because on the one hand, because the museum didn't have a collection, you were suddenly free. Right. You know, normally when you do a museum exhibition, let's say you look and see what do you have in your holdings? And that may shape some of the intellectual questions you want to ask. Well, because we had nothing, that meant that we had to really think from the very beginning, OK, what should this be? So on the one hand, it was a blank sheet of paper, which was wonderfully liberating. And on the other hand, as anybody that's ever written knows, that sometimes that blank sheet of paper is so terrifying. And so part of what I had to do was to realize that the way this was going to work is to call on my colleagues. And one of the things that the Smithsonian can do is we're the great convener. We can call any scholar anywhere in the world and they'll help us. So that's really what we did. As I said, let's talk to the best scholars and see what they think this museum should be. And then let's spend two years interviewing the public, doing focus groups, doing scientific sampling, and find out what they think this museum should be. And then we sat down with my curators and educators and said, okay, based on what we're hearing, here's the directions I think we should go. It sounds like you use the historian's toolkit or process to not only shape the vision for the museum in the same way that other historians shape a narrative for a book or article, but to also figure out what stories historians and the American people wanted the museum to tell. Absolutely. It really is nothing but what you've been trained to do as a historian, which is gather evidence, 
listen to folks, make your judgments, make your own arguments, and be able to defend it. And while this was frightening to say, oh my God, we can do anything we want, it was also really liberating because it really helped us think about how do you make this a broader story? How do you not make it just a story by African Americans for African Americans? And so I think being able to draw evidence and conversations from my colleagues, as well as from the general public, helped us to do that, helped us to come to one important phrase. And that phrase was, we did not want to give the public not just what it wanted. We also wanted to give the public what it needed, what stories it needed to hear about slavery or questions of gender that maybe not all the public wanted us to talk about. So I think it was really helpful to be able to really try to find that tension between what people wanted and what they needed. Is the tension between what people wanted and what people needed similar to the tension you've discussed in other interviews, which was that you really wanted the National Museum of African-American History and Culture to be a place that found the right tension between moments of pain and stories of resiliency and uplift? Absolutely. I think that as I began to talk to a variety of potential stakeholders, you know, it was interesting the different points of view. There were people who said, we want to support this museum because this will tell us what America once was, but now we're not that anymore, right? As if somehow by looking back at the African-American experience, we can say we were once flawed, but now we're not, right? There were other people who said, well, this has to be a Holocaust museum. You've got to focus this on all those moments of loss, and pain where America didn't live up to its stated ideal. And then there were others who said, well, what we really want is a museum of famous first and positive images so that we can lift the burden of racism off our children. Well, I listened to all that and I realized that in some ways they were all right. So I needed to find the tension that said, here are the moments that will make you cry as you ponder the pain of slavery or segregation. But you can't understand the kind of resiliency, the improvisational nimbleness without understanding the loss and the sacrifice. So I think we tried to, looking at every exhibition, trying to make sure that in the totality of the museum, you had that right tension. There were exhibits where you see an awful lot of difficult moments, others where you see less so. But if you look at the totality of the museum, I think we found the right balance. How did you decide which stories would be stories of pain and which would be stories of uplift? I think partly it was realizing after we talked to the scholars, and we talked to them almost every other month, but after a certain point, I said, okay, we've heard enough. We've heard from the general public. Let's go ahead and basically write big circles on paper and say, okay, we need to make sure we're telling the story of the colonial origins of the United States. Or we need to know that we're going to tell the story of the Civil War, for example. But I said, but we don't know how we're going to tell that story until we find artifacts. So part of it was is to really say we knew what we wanted in terms of the broader framework, but we wanted to find artifacts that would help us tell those stories. And then when we did that. I basically then sat down with the curators and said, you have to tell the kind of unvarnished truth. So it meant that when we talked about slavery, we talked about it both in terms of what it meant to an African-American community, but also what it meant to a broader American community. So it really was sort of an iterative process of looking at each story we wanted to tell, each of the exhibitions we wanted to create, what are the arguments within each exhibition, and making sure they had the right tension between resiliency and uplift and moments of despair. I wonder if you would tell us about one of the exhibits at the museum, maybe even your favorite exhibit, and use it to tell us about the curatorial process. Because throughout the Doing History series, historians have told us how they find, gather, and read through historical sources, and how they write history books and articles based upon what they've found and read. And historians who work in museums write history too, but they have like this awesome opportunity to write a very visual history, using some of the historical sources, no less, that they found to do it. And it would be really interesting to hear how you write a visual history in an exhibit. Well, first of all, I think you have to do what any historian has to do. You have to look at the evidence. You have to do your research. You have to make sure you're conversant with the secondary literature so that you really have immersed yourself in the field, right? Whatever the story is. And then what was really important was to help curators begin to write visually. In other words, we're not writing books on the wall. So it's not enough to write great narratives that an exhibition is really a marriage of word, idea, visual, and artifact. 
And so some people, like when I started early in my career in museums, I actually took some film writing classes, script writing classes, because I thought film was the best medium where people had to write visually. So I've always used the sort of tricks and lessons of film criticism and pass that on to my curators. But then if curators don't have that skill, that comes from the interaction with designers and educators. So ultimately, that if you craft an exhibition and you only get it by the written word, then it's not an exhibition. But that rather what you want is you want the written word in juxtaposition to an artifact that gets your attention or to an assemblage of objects and graphics that get your attention. So that the challenge is that unlike your traditional scholarship, museum scholarship by its nature is collaborative if it's going to turn into an exhibition. And that's a challenge for some scholars. Others find that notion of sort of taking what they want that's normally two-dimensional and make it three. Very, very exciting. It really seems like much of the work that goes into an exhibit is very similar to what the college and university-based historians do in their teaching and writing. And it makes me wonder, when you look at an exhibit, do you start the same way that you would a text-based research project with questions that you have about a subject? Well, I think it depends. So, for example, when one of the major exhibitions we did was Slavery and Freedom, because both the scholars and the public said, I love the public said to me, the number one thing we want to know about is slavery. And the number one thing we don't want to know about is slavery. So what was really important to us was to think about what were some of the questions that you'd want this exhibition either to answer or to at least posit. And so we sat down and talked about we wanted something that wouldn't be just confined to the continental United States. We wanted to talk about it from a diasporic lens. We said that we really felt it was essential to sort of help people understand how the slave trade was the economic engine of Europe and slavery was the economic engine of America. So we really said that it's not simply the story of the creation of slave culture, but it really is something that shapes the broader American experience. And then we said, how do we help people understand the lives of the enslaved in a very human scale? And so that's why, for example, we collected a slave cabin from a plantation off the coast of Charleston, South Carolina. And so it really is those kinds of questions that began to shape the stories and exhibitions we did. And then we tried to punctuate them with strong artifacts, graphics, and media. As history tells us who we are and how we came to be who we are, doing history can be quite contentious. And you've just told us about how you and your curators created an exhibit about slavery and freedom which are subjects that the public told you both wanted to know about and didn't want to know about. Would you tell us about some of the other challenges you face from members of the public and perhaps other museums while trying to build the historic and cultural institution the Smithsonian tasked you with building? First of all, it was to convey to anybody who began to work here that that was going to happen, that this was going to be a contentious debate, that you were going to realize that just being smart and scholarly wasn't enough, that part of my job was to create an environment that would protect the scholarship. So I recognized that working in the federal environment, I needed to have relations in Congress, obviously relations with my peers around the country, so that people would feel comfortable doing the difficult work that they did. And then I think it was crucially important for us to really say, let us tell the stories we need to tell Don't worry about whether you're going to be criticized or not. I'll handle that. Your job as a curator is to give me the best scholarship on whatever the subject is, whether it was on the diaspora or on music or on film and theater. And let's make sure we've got the most cutting edge interpretation, but I'll make sure that we can survive the culture wars. It sounds like your historian's training really helped you build a museum and craft its exhibits. Has your training also helped you deal with those contentious moments that happen when someone contacts you and says, well, your exhibit says this, but your facts are wrong? I think part of it is, as you know, one of the biggest challenges for the public to understand is that history is interpretation based on reason, based on evidence, not just based on a whim. So part of the job was to really use that training to help the public understand what it is that we do. 
And one of the things we're trained to do with our history is we're good at making an argument, right? So I'm used to listening to people raise counter arguments, but also have enough faith in our own scholarship to say, well, this is where we're going to stand on this argument. The other thing that was really crucial was to recognize that we had to be ready to answer any criticism, because unlike when you write a publication or a monograph, most of the critics are people who have comparable training as you. When you're working in museums, the critics can be, you know, people who know very little or who convince that they understand something in ways that other people do not. And so you have to really be, it's almost like a classroom. You've got to be able to explain what you want to do to different portions of the community and help them all explain it and help them all understand it. The present influences how we view the past. And I wonder if you have any hopes for how the present of the future will influence the stories that the National Museum of African-American History and Culture will tell in the future. Well, my hope is that, first of all, we've crafted a museum that is as much about today and tomorrow as it is about yesterday. So therefore, we explicitly spend a lot of time discussing what we should be collecting today for 20 years from now or 50 years from now. So while we tell stories of things like Black Lives Matter in the museum, you've also collected a lot of other material around issues of protest or the community police relationships that may not show up in the next decade or so, but that they'll be there because I have never forgotten how early in my career in museums, there were stories I wanted to tell, but the museums didn't have any artifacts that would tell that story. So part of what we want to do is is free up future curators to be able to understand 2016. And so I think that's part of what we do. But the other part was to realize that a strong element of a museum is making your scholarship accessible. So crafting public programs around important questions and that allow us to bring people from different points of view, allow us to really illuminate all the dark corners of the American experience. That's one of the positive things we try to do because we think by getting history to contextualize the world we're in today is going to be very helpful to people as they try to find tools to help them live their lives. For us, that's what museums do. That's what history does. It gives people tools to help them figure out how do they negotiate, how do they navigate the world they're in today. Do you think that the tools museums provide people for grappling with their past and their present will continue to be offered in physical objects and spaces? Because everything seems to be going digital today. And I wonder whether you see digital museums in the future. I think digital is always a part of the museums in the last decade. And when we built the National Museum, we actually said we start out by building the virtual museum first. And so thinking about the role of the virtual, the role of technology, how crucial that is. But what I also realized is when we did a lot of research with sort of younger folks, millennials and others who, you know, grew up with this technology, one of the things that was so fascinating to me was it kept coming back that many of these people, many of these students, many of these adults had dealt with the virtual all their lives. And there was a great interest in seeing the actual the authentic. And so my notion is that museums will always be innovative and nimble and that the virtual will be a major part of what they do, but there's nothing more powerful than the authentic, than that marriage of actual object, word, idea, and visual. And I think that'll always be something that will engage people, especially at places like the Smithsonian. Before we conclude our conversation, would you tell us how we can visit the National Museum of African American History and Culture? And whether the museum has any special exhibits or exhibitions coming up? Well, because the museum just opened in you know September of 2016, there are changing exhibitions that will start to be available to the public in 2017. We'll draw more from our photographic collections. We'll look at exhibitions that are looking at, let's say, the anniversary of the Poor People's Campaign of 1968. So there'll always be changing exhibitions there. But I think for us, we've given people this really interesting narrative that takes you from the 15th century to today that looks at culture and community. And so we hope that the public will spend time as they are now grappling with what we've presented and we will continue to fine tune that as that moves on. We love the fact that the public loves the museum and that people have to go online to get passes so they can come into the museum. One of the things that is so powerful to me is that traditionally when you go to the Smithsonian, you spend an hour and a half in a museum. 
I thought, well, people were going to be excited they'll spend three hours. We're averaging a visit time of people spending six hours in the museum. That's exciting and humbling. That's, wow, that's really incredible. Congratulations. That's what I said. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) That really makes the history that you're conveying there really powerful because people are really taking six hours to take it in. You know, what you hope is that people, not everybody's going to read every label, but you hope people understand the juxtaposition between the labels and the artifacts. And part of what's happening is people are really trying to understand that, but they are having those conversations. You see it over and over again. I guess, let me give you one great example. A woman came in. She was taking her probably 12-year-old son through the museum. And she was at a point where we were talking about the assassination of Medgar Evers, the civil rights leader from Mississippi. And she noticed that there was a woman standing there kind of listening as she was explaining what happened to her son. Well, it turned out the woman was Medgar Evers' daughter. And she was in one of the pictures that they were talking about. And what was so wonderful is that the son the 12 or 13-year-old son suddenly realized this was not about something that happened so long ago, but it was about people like him. And he reached over and hugged her and thanked her for her family sacrifice. And that story goes back to your point about the power of museums to humanize history. It really was. It was very powerful to all of us. Lonnie, where is the best place for us to look for more information about you, the museum, and how we can contact you if we still have questions about the museum or doing history for the public? Well, the museum's website is the best way to reach us because it'll connect you with me. It'll connect you with other curators. It'll let you ask questions. It'll let you be a member and join the museum if you'd like. So that's the best place to go, I think, to get more information. Lonnie Bunch, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us how you do history for the public at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It is my pleasure. Thank you. At their core, history and doing history are about people. The study of history tells us who we are and how we came to be who we are, which is why it's important that historians humanize the past and provide opportunities for different audiences, or publics if you will, to consider the past. These twin goals of history are why Lonnie loves museums. They provide spaces for historians to present and interpret historical research and safe gathering places for people to come together and grapple with their past. During our conversation, Lonnie noted that the best museums are almost like backyard picnics, events where people bring their favorite foods and gather together to exchange stories, ideas, and news. And I really love this description because it places people at the heart of history and the historical process, which is why I want to expand his statement to say that the practice of history is like a backyard picnic. And this is so true because history is a collaborative process, which is based on interpretation, reason, and evidence. And every guest historian, archivist, and genealogist we talk to in the Doing History, How Historians Work series has noted how they rely on help from others to find and read historical sources, to shape and hone their interpretations of the past, to craft the written and visual presentations of their work, and to present what they found to the public. History doesn't just tell us who we are as people, communities, and individuals. It gives us the tools we need to work together as human beings to navigate and better understand our present day world by showing us how the people of the past negotiated and shaped their world. For more information about Lonnie, plus links and notes for today's conversation, visit the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash museums. And while you're on the website, you should also consider signing up for the Franklin Gazette newsletter, which will not only deliver the show notes for each week's episode into your inbox, but it will also give you access to Poor Richards Club, our social community for Ben Franklin's world listeners. 